What's going on? Attract passive income followers. I'm here with my main man, Jeff Rose, CFP, financial advisor. Thank you for joining us today. Now, before we get into the interview with Jeff, uh, Jeff, uh, his uh, YouTube channel is Good Financial Sense. Uh, he has one that's Soldier of Finance. He has one that talks about temporary uh, life insurance. And he just told me that him and his wife just created another uh, channel uh, where they're both are working together uh, for online business. So, Jeff, thank you for joining us today. How, how's yeah. it going? It's going good, man. Thanks for having me on here. Oh, no problem. No problem. Now, before we actually get into the, the meat of the subject, the first question I would like to ask you, for those who don't know, because um, some people think when you go and get financial advice, you go to a regular financial planner or whatever. What is a CFP? What is a certified financial planner? Um, a certified financial planner is, you know, we're financial advisors that, that went the extra step. Um, you know, to become a CFP, it's not required. Uh, once I actually went to the program, you know, I didn't get an immediate pay raise for getting the designation. You know, I actually took, I did the fast track program, which took me about just over a year of like cram sessions. You know, I'd be gone for four days out of the month learning the material. Then I had to take a two day exam. And uh, I think the, the way that I best explain it is when you think of a, an accountant, you know, you can go to an accountant and get your taxes done or you can go to a CPA. You know, the CPA is going to have that much more knowledge. They have to keep up more on the tax code than your typical accountant tax preparer. With the CFP, you know, we're uh, educated in, you know, the estate planning, insurance, investments, basically the broad spectrum of all financial planning. And it's something that we have to stay on top of, you know, each and every year. So that's, you know, we, it's like I said, it wasn't required by myself. You know, I actually put myself to the torture of going through all that stuff. But, you know, I was, uh, gosh, probably about four years ago, five years ago, once I got the designation. And, you know, I was younger then. So for me, it was kind of like the fast track of getting knowledge in the financial planning space. You know, that's why I did it. Mm. So it was definitely an extra step from a regular financial planner that you may see at, well, I don't want to say at Edwards and Jones or something, but just you, you take it to the next level when it comes to financial education. Yeah, you know, and an Edward Jones, an Edward Jones guy could be a CFP, you know, if they so they so chose. So I mean, you see CFPs everywhere. It's just a matter of if they actually want to take the extra effort and, and go for it. And, and I'm the type of guy where I always want to challenge myself. I never want to be comfortable. So I mean, for me, the CFP was just a uh, just a, a recognition that to to my clients and other potential clients that hey. I'm serious about financial planning and, you know, because I went to the extra mile than the other advisors you know, that happened. Because so, you don't necessarily, necessarily work for a company. You actually have your own business. Can you, can you talk about that? Like, because, you know, you learn your education and now you have your own uh, office where you have to go out and get your own clients. How, how is that? Yeah, so, you know, typically, and you can, there's so many different ways of, of starting to become a financial advisor. You know, initially, I did the tradition, we would call the traditional model. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked for a company called AG Edwards, which, similar to Edward Jones, they were based out of St. Louis and was with them for five years. And then they actually were bought out by Wachovia Bank, who then were bought out by Wells Fargo. And this mm -hmm. is uh, several years or so ago. So I did the traditional route where I was working for the big company. And then whenever they were bought out by Wachovia, I just I looked at something else. You know, I wanted something else. So me and three guys, we left. We started our own financial planning firm. And not to get too technical, but just last year, I dropped my securities license, which is my Series 7, mm -hmm. which basically means that I can no longer earn a commission off the sale of securities. So I can't sell a stock, earn a commission, can't sell a bond, can't sell an ETF. I can still do stocks. ETFs, you know, mutual funds. I just have to do it in the fee capacity. Okay. And the, my big motivation for doing so, uh, I formed it's called a registered investment advisory firm, and I did it because of the blog. Um, I did it because mm -hmm. when you have a Series Seven, you are regulated by FINRA, which is just one of the regulatory bodies, and to do anything online, you are trapped in this box. There's only so many things that you can say, and if you say it, you have to say it a certain way. <laughs> And I did it for two and a half years and got just fed up. And, you know, with Twitter and Facebook, like some of the YouTube videos that you've seen, 
there's yeah. no way I could have done those. No way. And really? those, these are the things I needed to do. I mean, me as an individual, I needed to do it. So that's why just uh, last May, I actually really truly started my own firm where now it's just, you know, myself and re- recently just hired a junior advisor to, on staff with me. But it's been one of the best things I've ever done. Well, and so that's a fee only advisor, right? Correct. Okay, good, good. Okay, well, let, Jeff, here's the thing. Why do we need a financial planner? Can can we just do it all for ourselves when it comes to money? You know, that's a it's an interesting question because you know, in some cases I would say yes, but you know, I meet with people all the time that either they don't want to get it, or they don't get it, or they think they get it and they'll go several years thinking that they're doing okay. Mm-hmm. Only to like reflect back and think, oh crap, you know, I should have done this. And, and let me, just a quick story, I think that kind of illustrates that. Yeah. Was this is a client that I met with? Uh, she's still a client, and she, you know, she's not a big client by any means, but she had invested, oh gosh, this is probably like 15 years ago. She had about 15 grand in a, a mutual fund. And she went with, uh, actually it was Prime America. I don't know if you've heard of that company. Yes, I've heard of that company. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, she was with a Prime America rep. And the rep, I guess, after a few years, he quit, moved on, whatever. But she left it with that fund. Uh, same mutual fund. You know, it's still with Prime America. She had no idea who the guy was. And then she comes to me. And the 15000 had grown to be about forty or 45000 right? So, okay. you know, in the time span, it made some money. So, I mean... From her perspective, she did okay. Well, when I actually looked at the fund and did some research, I mean, this fund was horrible. I mean, literally, like, over the last 15 years, it was always, you can always, like, kind of like consumer reports, you can see how the fund ranks out of all the other funds that are similar to it. Okay. And it, and it was always in the bottom. Like, every single year, it was in the bottom. And I showed her where if she would have bought even an index fund or an, an average fund, you know, not not – Picking the best of the best, but just doing something that was middle of the road, uh, she would have had at least forty to fifty thousand dollars more, you know, in her in her savings in her retirement account. But because yeah. she did it on her own, or she thought that she was okay, I mean, it cost her. And I see that all the time. You know, and making slight changes, you know, even if it's meeting for, with a financial advisor for, you know, just like your annual checkup, like you go to your doctor, it could have a pretty dramatic effect on you know your years you know your retirement years later on okay but now, that's just my experience <laughs> okay now you i'm sure you've heard of a guy called uh warren buffett before right i think i've heard of him <laughs> <laughs> well you know i've read a few things that he said and uh he be- he believes in in buying um great companies companies that will be around for a long time and it seems that he's mostly for individual stocks versus mutual funds. So that's my next question to you. What is better, mutual funds or regular stocks, individual stocks? Um, you know, typically I would say I think if you will make a lot more money if you're able to find the right individual stocks. No question. You know, like really? a lot of my clients that are – they have made higher returns. Uh, they have a larger individual stock holding. That being said, their portfolios do a lot more of this. Oh because, yeah. Because you know, I mean, and and the the, the key thing too is, is picking the right stocks, and that's why it's hard, especially for a beginner investor, because you know you're just starting to invest and you want to do. 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, whatever you think you can afford, even if it's five grand, 10 grand. It's like, okay, I've got this money. Now, what am I, what am I going to buy? What am I going to invest into? Mm-hmm. And let's say you, you buy two or three stocks and two or three of them do okay, but you have that one that just happens to be the unlucky pick and could literally like, you know, wipe out, you know, 50% of your, your investment. Okay. And uh, that hurts. That hurts. And uh, you get gun shy. And, you know, from some of my own investing, so I do, I do a little bit of both. I do individual stocks and I do mutual funds. And the mutual funds for me are my are my protection, really? because I've done some pretty good some pretty good stock picks and I've done some really poor stock picks. So uh, I've kind of like told myself, listen, you know, when you have a mutual fund, you're going to have a professional money manager. 
I'm going to rely on them to manage part of my portfolio, but then I'm going to you know do some of my own as well. Okay, now that, now that brings me to another question. Okay, when looking for a, a, a stock, an individual stock, should you what should you have in your head? I mean, what should you think? You should like for instance Johnson and Johnson. Uh, I saw a guy on YouTube was talking about that. That company has been around for ages, right? And when I'm when I'm, when I'm gone and passed away, and my kids or have grandkids, it probably it will be here. Like, how do you pick a good individual stock? You know, my my basic rule of thumb is this. If you're going to buy an individual stock, then you better know what that company does. And, you know, to use your Johnson & Johnson example, I mean, they're a big corporation. I mean, they don't just do one thing. You know, and if I'd asked you, like, hey, what, what all do they do? And if you sat there and thought, well, you know, I really don't know. Then you know, is do you really want to invest money into something just because you've heard of it and it's a household name? Does that really make it a worthwhile investment? Uh, let me give you a, a, my own personal example. Whenever I was deployed to Iraq back in 2005, I don't think I I may have bought a few stocks along the way, but the one um, Under Armour, which is the you know the workout clothing and all yeah. that stuff. Got so pr prior to Iraq. I never owned a piece of Under Armour, Under Armour clothing. I thought it was tremendously overpriced. Would never see myself ever buying that. Mm -hmm. But when you're in Iraq and it's 140 degrees outside, you know we start. We got Under Armour underneath our, our uh, uniforms, and I had I actually shaved my head while I was overseas, so I had like a skull cap. I had the Under Armour socks. I mean, I was an Under Armour spokesmodel, you know, <laughs> while overseas. And uh, in 2005 they had an IPO. So they actually came out with their stock. And like, I was all about it. Because not only was I, like I said, the, the Under Armour spokesmodel, but dear Lord, like 75% 70, of everyone in my platoon was wearing some form of Under Armour. Okay. You know, and that was like the entire military, you know, Under Armour something. So it was a company that one I believed in, I was supporting, and I understood what they did. So I mean, for me, that was an easy purchase. So typically, I say, hey, make sure it's a product or service that you use and understand what they do. Uh, I love it when a client calls me and says, hey, Jeff, what do you think about this company? And it's a stock I've never heard of. And I'm like, I don't know. I've never heard of them. What do they do? I don't know. I thought you would know. I'm like, what? so why do you want to invest money in something? You can't even tell me what they do. It doesn't make any exactly. sense. Exactly. So at least know what they do and make sure it's something that you support. And hopefully, it's a product or service that you, that you have in your own household. So Jeff, okay, that's a good um, example you use with Under Armour, but how do you know that's not a Fed? How do you know that twenty, thirty years down the road that another company won't come and compete against those guys? Well, you know, at that point in time, that's when I mean you don't know, and that's when you got to make changes. Uh, you know, for I think a more recent example I can think of, you know, you think of Kmart. You know, Kmart was like they were it, you know, at one time. And then, true, yeah, yeah. then obviously Walmart came into play. Then, you know, then, you know, Kmart filed for bankruptcy, I think, back in 03, 04, back in there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they became non existent. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. then you think of, uh, you know, think of General Motors, GM. I yeah. mean, that was a company that was going nowhere. You know, you, they, you thought that they would never go away. I mean, they didn't, but if you owned their stock when they went for bankruptcy, I mean, you lost all your money. You know, so yeah. you don't know. You just have to, you basically ride the wave. And like with Under Armour, for example, you know, maybe five, ten years from now, there will be a competitor, and then that's the point in time you're like, you walk away. You sell your stock, make, you know, count your profits, and move on to the next venture. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. So what is the best approach? You know, some people, when it, you know, they don't have like a lump sum of money. So would you recommend... They pay fifty to a hundred dollars a month, or is it best to some buy the stock, set it there, and forget it? I mean, what approach does one take? I'm I'm a really I'm a big fan of the whole set up the automatic investing, you know, fifty hundred, whatever you can afford, because I can't tell you how many times I've met with a young person that was so gun ho in saving, and they had these big ambitions. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, and they never pull the trigger. Because they always they want to wait till they had a larger amount, mm -hmm. and then you know had they actually set up you know, the fifty to hundred dollars a month, Excuse me. you know after a year's time, I mean they would have had that amount, and most likely they wouldn't even notice it. 
That's and true. so, you know, from personal experience, I, I always try to advocate, hey, let's get started small. You know, build it up. You know, if you want to do a larger amount later on, we'll do it. But let's just get started. I mean, the key thing is get started. You know, so start doing that 25 50 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford, and then go from there. Okay. So a, a young family that just had a kid, you know, finished college, you know, have the, you know, the, the house now with the white picket fence. What should they do immediately? What's the first thing they should do when it comes to saving and investing? What would you recommend? Um, you know, the first thing, you know, with uh, one of the concepts I talk about in the book, uh, you know, soldier of finance, and something I bring kind of from my, my military background is is having the battle buddy conversation. Ah, and, battle buddy. Okay. You know, so, you know, for me, you know, me and my spouse, she's my battle buddy. And, you know, whenever I was deployed, as we just recently got married, it was just having those money conversations. You know, not just money conversations, but it's having goal conversations and just what, you know, expectations. And, you know, it's knowing, it's, it's funny, I talked to so many couples where, you know, like one spouse will have a lot of debt, maybe the other one doesn't. You know, obviously that causes a rift. So, you know, it's just having those conversations like, hey, how are we going to address this? You know, what, is it your priority to get this debt taken care of? You know, are we okay pay, making the minimum payment? You know, what, what, tell me, give me the emotional feelings behind it. Yeah. And it's just having those those money discussions, you know, with your battle buddy to make sure that you're both on the same page. Because then once you figure out what are your goals, what are you really trying to do, you know, then you can work on those goals and work on them together as a team. And, you know, to me, that's that's very important. And a lot of couples don't do that nowadays. It's weird. Like they, they, they do it maybe like later on when things kind of hit ahead. But if you have it in the beginning, it just makes it so much easier. And I, I know with us, and maybe we were – I'll say fortunate to where I was deployed where, I mean, we are, that's all you could do is talk on the phone and have these conversations. Mm -hmm. But, uh, man, that was so helpful for us you know, to have, you know, kind of those initial, hey, let's do this. You know, here's our first goal. You know, once we do this, then we want to move on to this. And so we already knew, like, kind of the next steps that we were going to have. Obviously, there's always going to be hiccups along the way. But, you know, we were ready for that. And it helped out a lot. Hmm. You know, a lot of people are afraid to have that conversation. You know, I get yeah. a lot of questions on my YouTube channel where it's some people have separate accounts. You know, the wife has her account, the husband has their accounts, and they expect to finish strong in the end. You know, money is a very touchy subject, you know, these days. Yeah, you know, and that's something, it's been hard because, especially, I mean, situation. So here I am, obviously, I'm my wife's now a stay at home, you know, mom. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I have the income. But the one thing, and it's been challenging at times, but I've always, I, I never want to hold that over her. You know, we've okay. got three sons. I mean, she does, she does more than I do. I mean, she earns, she deserves more pay than, than I'm getting. So, I mean, but we, you know, we don't have separate, everything's joint, you know, like for better, for worse. I mean, she's my, my partner, you know, so she gets half. She actually probably gets more than half, but anyway. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's how it's set up, and that's how it should be. You know, so mm -hmm. I see couples that do have the split accounts, and I don't get it. Because, you know, how can that be your battle buddy? And for those that, when I talk about the battle buddy concept, you know, when we were basic training, you had your battle buddy that you were assigned. So this was your guy, mm -hmm. you know, a guy in your platoon that you had to know everything about. You know, you had to know their grandfather's name, if they had any brothers or sisters, their parents' names, you know, where they went to high school, you know, when they lost their virginity. I mean, you had to know everything about them. Mm -hmm. And your drill sergeant would drill you and ask you questions about your battle. But if you didn't know it, then, you know, God help you. Yeah. So I mean, it was imperative to, you know, find out as much as you could. And it's the same concept with your spouse or whomever, because you've got to know that information. you got to know what, how they tick, how they work. Okay. All right. So we talked about um, the stocks and individual versus mutual funds. But, Jeff, we're in a so-called recession right now. You know, and a lot of people lost a lot of money in the stock market. So what would you advise that person? Should they keep their money in the in the stock market or should they take it out and wait for, uh, you know, a, a better, better times? Or what, what should they do for a person that has their money in the stock market? You know, I'm a, you always hear the uh, concept of diversification. You know, I mean, yeah. financial advisors beat the, beat the crap out of that term, you know, beat it to death. Totally. You know, you know what? Uh, the way that I feel like that I've been able to diversify myself is, you know, I do have money in the stock market. I do have, you know, stocks. I have mutual funds. I have your traditional investments. 
I think, in that, and also you got to incorporate some like alternative investments. You know, some people are buying commodities. You know, buying gold. I'm not the guy the type of guy who's going to buy <laughs> gold bars. I mean, I, I, that's just not me. I think mm -hmm. I still try to make sense of it, and I, I really don't. And I know there's some people out there that really advocate that, but you know, you can buy some ETFs. You know, that that buy you know tr precious metals and and you know commodities and you know non-stock market related goods. Um, I'm also a really big fan of peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. Uh, companies like Lending Club and Prosper. I don't know if you've heard of those two. Yeah, I have. But you know, mm. Lending Club for me has actually been one of my more popular things. I, I got a few blog posts, a couple, I think at least one uh, YouTube video, and it's just an interesting concept to where you know you're investing, you're investing to people to you know pay back their their loans, you know, through uh, through these entities. And uh, you know, I think the return there has been anywhere between nine or ten percent over the last three years. Really. And, you know, for people in the stock market, I mean, I don't know if they could say that. You know, it's one of those things where I wish I had more money in there, but uh, and I will. You know, I'm I'm not going to go all that direction, but I definitely think it's a piece of the pie. You know, a piece of the whole diversification pie. So it's just finding. You know, some, for some people, it's real estate. You know, I, um, I've got some friends that are really avid real estate investors, and that's all they do. But they're actually they invest in the stock market to diversify from their real estate investments. Oh, so, really? I mean, yeah, because I mean they're all they're concentrated in real estate, so they're looking to do some traditional investing just to make sure that you know their business doesn't go up. So, and for me, and that's why with the uh, dollars and roses, you know, our online income, I mean, that's to diversify myself because you figure um, I, I'm in the stock market, so my my fees are generated because of you know what goes on in the stock market, and my investments are in the stock market, mm -hmm. so I better have some diversification, so, you know, hence the online businesses. Okay. Well, I think, you know, with people who have lost jobs and everything is kind of bad right now, uh, I think the emergency fund is something that is that, that should be very important in a person's life. How much should a person have in their emergency fund, would you say? Man, it's like, this is like the number that it ever, ever evolves, um, you know, you hear like Dave Ramsey where he tells you, you know, have at least a minimum of $1,000 to get going. Like that's kind of like your the first baby step. And, I mean, it's a good number. I mean, it's a good number for people to shoot for that have never had an emergency fund. But the reality is, is that $1,000 ain't going to cut it. You know, maybe that cuts it, you know, in a small Midwestern town you know, like where I live. <laughs> but, you know, if you live in New York City, $1,000 yeah. can going get you nowhere. You know what I mean? In about a week, you're done. You know, so, you know, I try to come up with a formula like in my book to where, you know, what's that starting point? And to me, I figure is like, you know, you got to take all your living expenses, you know, take everything, your house, your rent payment or mortgage payment, all your bills and whatever that dollar amount is for you, like that's your starting point. So, I mean, okay. at least have that to where you can take care of a month, uh, one month's expenses. Obviously, that is not enough. Not even close to it, but it's a starting point because most people don't even have that. You know, because true. it's just it's difficult. Uh, you know, one thing where I've always shot towards, I've always been on the higher side. I, I you know, twelve months was always like our goal. Uh, you know, right now I think we're pushing eighteen to twenty-four months of household expenses. You know, in in emergency. So I mean, we're we're de obviously I'm a financial planner, so I'm gonna I better practice what I preach, right? <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, I say for the for the, the non-financial planner types, I would say, you know, at least six months, 12 months is more ideal. It also depends on your job. You know, how, how, how stable does your job feel? I mean, if you, if your company is going through layoffs every other week, then you better start putting some money away because you might be the next one to get the, the pink slip. So, you, you know, and I'm going to have to uh, chime in on that. One thing that kills me, and I get a lot of responses back to this on my on, for my YouTube channel is that people get in their job, they get a job and they become what I say comfortable. Like they go out, they party all the time, they have a lot of entertainment, but a lot of people don't save money. So they don't think that one day that your boss may come into your office and say, Hey, here's the pink slip. See yeah. you later. So you have to always save for those rainy days. That's a very important thing. And uh, so I, you would basically say a minimum, no, a minimum of six months emergency fund that a person should have, right? I would, absolutely. Okay, now here's another thing, because you know a lot of people love to buy that house. You know that's a big thing. Um, you got 
foreclosures, all kinds of things going on. When a person's getting ready to buy a home, how much down do you think a person should have in order to move in that right direction? You know, it's funny because, you know, you always, you always says put as much down as you could, you know, mm-hmm. and that, uh, that concept worked out really, really well until about 2008, <laughs> you know, when people were putting 20% down on, uh, you know, my mom actually lives in Las Vegas. Oh, and- you know, she she bought she got in before it all before it all took off, and uh, you know her house she bought her house for two hundred seventy five thousand dollars paid okay. cash, and this is not some fancy house. I mean, it's a two story house, but I mean it's it's in one of those subdivisions where it's all the cookie cutter. You know, her backyard you could um, it's probably a little bit graphic, but you could hawk a loogie, you know, from her 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 back door or patio door like over her her. Uh, or back wall. I mean, it's it's nothing. I mean, there's no her front yard. You could cut it with a pair of scissors, like cut the grass, you know, with a pair of scissors. So, really. And um, within nine months of her moving in, her house appraised it doubled. It went from two seventy five to five fifty. Wow. Just like, just to get. I mean, this is the this is like the when you, people start talking about how crazy it was. Like she was in the middle of it. So you know. So now. Think of you just being re- relocated. You're moving to Las Vegas. House prices are going crazy. You think they're going to go up, so you got to get in. You know, got to get in like buy it now for the five fifty goes to seven fifty. Yeah. So I mean, if you go but based on that advice, you want you're supposed to put twenty percent down. You know, what I mean, you're supposed to put as much down as you can. And obviously, fast forward to present day, like was that really the smart move? You know, in that mm. case, absolutely not. I mean, that completely backfired. Now you got twenty percent down at home. That's fifty percent below what you you know paid for it. Um, but then you have the little thing called PMI, you know, where you don't you know, the private mortgage insurance, which it's, it's it's an expense that you don't want. I mean, you're paying it's like paying one of these stupid bank fees that you shouldn't be paying. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think you at least want to avoid PMI. But uh, I'm not. I can't say that you want to put as much down as possible. I, I, I'm also a big believer in liquidity. You know, having cash on hand. To you know, for flexibility to do things to have more control. So, I say avoid PMI. Then after that, I wouldn't be as gun ho uh, for right now. You know, it also depends on where you're at in your life. I mean, are you? Is this your dream home? We're going to be there for the next thirty years. Mm. Uh, I don't know the stats, but I think I'm sure people relocate probably two, three, four times. You know, or change houses two, three, four times. So, in their lifetime. So you, um, yeah. So I'd say you know, bare minimum to avoid PMI. But any more than that, you know, hold on to your cash. Okay. Now, I got to ask you this question because it's all, it's very popular subject this week. The Facebook stuff. Everybody's, I saw you put a video up on it. I didn't have time to check it out. Yeah. Um, so, everybody, so explain what's going on with Facebook. Uh, what's actually happening right now with Facebook? Yeah. So, you know, this is the, uh, the big event that people have been waiting for for, it seems like years now. Uh, Facebook finally filed their intent at an initial public offering, IPO. It's a $5 billion offering. It's the largest in history. I think the closest one to it was Zynga, which just filed theirs in last, last December for $1 billion, to give you an idea. And I forgot, I didn't, I forgot what Google's amount was, but I think it was like $750 million. I, If I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but I think that was the number. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this is like by far, not even, there's nothing even closest to it. I mean, it's leaps and bounds above that. So what does that mean exactly? So for all the people that have held private stock, so for, before the IPO, if you want to buy Facebook shares, you kind of had to know somebody. Uh, you had to somehow get it. You could buy it off. People could sell it kind of in the, uh, I call it, I'm going to say the black market, but like the underground market. You know, there's people that you can buy it from. But it's a lot harder to get, and plus you have to have you gotta have connections, you gotta have deep pockets. So now they're filing where you could actually buy it on the, the stock in the stock market. Mm-hmm. So we don't know exactly when it's going to be released. We don't know what the share price is going to be. I think I saw an estimated based on the outstanding shares it would be somewhere around fifty to fifty three dollars. I think I saw that, um, but you know you don't know for sure. So. So now it's going to become a publicly traded stock. So anyone that owns Facebook shares now, I, I think, what was it, like 100, like 100 people are going to become millionaires like overnight, I think, and how many billionaires are going to become. I mean, yeah, pretty, it's going to be 
pretty ridiculous. I mean, it's going to be a fairly insane amount of, of wealth that's going to uh, come about. So, so here probably in the summertime, if you want to buy Facebook shares, you'd be able to do it. But typically how IPOs work, you know, if it's this big of a buzz, where uh, actually like with Under Armour, I want to say like its IPO price, I think it was like $14. So that was okay. its price. By the time it actually hit the market to where like you and I could buy it, it was like 28 bucks. So anyone that held it, you know, they, they get it 14. They just don't, I mean, they're already making money from the private stock going to IPO. And then they just made that much more in the secondary market. So if Facebook hits, hits, uh, hits at $53 as IPO by the time that you and I could buy it, it could be a hundred, you know, just literally in that, the first day. And that's, that's, hmm. so that's exciting to see how that's all going to play out. Now, let me ask you a question. You, you said that the people who have already had Facebook stuck are probably going to be million. Well, not probably. They are going to be millionaires. Who yeah. are those people? Are the, the, the employees or private investors? Uh, employees, uh, in private investors. I just read on one article, there was a guy who was a graffiti artist that painted the original like Facebook office. Okay. And instead of getting paid cash... He accepted Facebook stock as former payment. Get out of here. I've, and he, I thought it was, I forgot the number, but I mean, it's going to be several million that he's going to get. And all because he took Facebook stock. Wow. Isn't, oh, isn't that beautiful? So I have to ask the question, how does one become a private investor? Um, well, a lot of the, a lot of times you have these venture capitalists, you know, these are the firms that they're looking at these startup companies and they see potential there, so they're going to ante up some of their own money and invest in the company, hoping for this, hoping for the big payday to go IPO. You know, they don't always work out, but that's who you see these big, you know, VCs, venture capitalists to have. I mean, I saw some that were investing like two hundred million, seven hundred fifty million. I mean, they're investing big blocks of money, and you know, with that, they're getting you know partial ownership in the company. Um, and then the other people, I want to say. I actually tried to look at how to buy the, the private shares, and it was this whole like registration process you had to, for one, there were more buyers than sellers. So, you know, for me to actually do it, you'd have to probably be in the Silicon Valley and just kind of know someone, you know, or on Wall Street to get in. But, uh, yeah, investment bankers, VCs, and uh, employees, you know, people that uh, somehow had some relationship uh, with Facebook along the way. Because I think Facebook, when it first started, weren't there offices like in Brazil or something like that? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I thought I was. I mean, I, I'll, I'm basing this off the uh, Social Network, the movie. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but they were. Uh, I thought that was in California. They're working out of a house. Oh, could have been. Could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Okay. Um. So, two last questions I have for you. First question I have for you. Who is your favorite financial advisor that we all know out there right now in the big in the big world? Who who would you who do you like out there right now? Man, you know they just had a I think it was like gobankingrates.com just had a contest like vote for your top financial person, you know, of the year and you had like Susie Orman and Jim Cramer and uh David Bach and you know what? I th are you, is that is that you're referring to like some of the the bigger names, the household yeah, names? Those names, yeah. You know, I for me, I have to say I'm a big David Bach fan. Really, uh, automatic millionaire, and I think the reason is because I really re resonate with him because you know he was a financial advisor, mm -hmm. and you know he basically gave up his practice so he could devote it to helping the underserved, you know, helping the people that had the fifty to hundred dollars a month, you know, basically just giving them the education tools they needed to start start investing yeah and you know a lot of what he started i mean that's with some of my inspiration of starting the blog and you know with the book and just doing other various projects like that so personal bias but uh, i mean he's the one he's one of the guys i like because he just, he just makes it simple you know he just kind of breaks down he's got some really good basic principles did you uh by any way did you catch uh suzy ormy last night i did not uh what's the guy that took over larry king's uh spot Pierce Morgan. Pierce Morgan. She was on Pierce Morgan last night. Okay. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Because we talked about... Because she actually is a CFP. Okay. 
Yeah, you, you, I, you told I me that. Know, I didn't even know that until I just happened to read something that because she actually doesn't use the title, which it's actually for me is probably good or bad. I actually have some beef with Susan because her whole new like debit card, her debit card thing that came out, the prepaid card. Yeah, prepaid card. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw, but she um, when that first was released, she got she had a lot of you know attack. I don't say attacks, but she did. You know, people questioning her motives and. You know, she was on Twitter, and she actually referred to some of my f- fellow like personal finance bloggers. So she called one of them an idiot. You know, for because he was in essence bashing it. And I mean, if you read his post on it, I mean, it was a well thought out, well researched post. And she never addressed any, and she still hasn't. She still hasn't addressed any of the uh, the feedback. You know, just on on her her card. And she just started calling, you know, she called a New York Times writer, you know, she called him out and just, I mean, she went back and apologized afterwards, but. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was in the, then the personal finance blogosphere, it, it was like, it was the news, you know, for that week of uh, what Susie Orman was up to. And I think she's charging like uh, $3 a month or something for that card. And I thought about that. I was like, wow, she had like a million users, $3 a month. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of money yeah. <laughs> for a month. Okay, yeah. uh, I think the, the the biggest complaint with that card was uh, what was you know she had claimed that it would help people build their credit score. I mean, yeah, she, she did, she, and she claimed upset. that last night also. And I mean, if you look at you read the news, there's even on the the, the disclosures on the actual paperwork of the card, it says like it, it will not. I mean, and oh, it's really? like yeah, I mean, so like that's the part that I mean, she basically. She's hoping, she's trying to get it to do that, but at this point in time, it does not. So, Ooh, okay, that that okay. was the big the big beef about, uh, the, about the whole thing. So, okay, and the last question I have for you is, what is your best financial book out there? What book would you recommend that totally change your life? That's a great book. Ooh, man, the best book. You know, some of the be- the best books. My bookshelf's over here, so I'm just, uh... <laughs> you know, as far as like just really a book that really changed, really changed my mindset was uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad from uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Mm-hmm. And you know, some people aren't big fans of Kiyosaki, and you know, some of some of the principles, I guess. I mean, you know, yeah, they're a little bit far fetched, but it was his book that really gave me just the the belief or the vision that, you know, you, there is more than just your nine to five job, you know, that you do can build this cash flow quadrant and build, you know, passive income, you know, which we all know is really not passive, but you know, it, but you put a little bit of hard work, you can make a lot more in your typical, you know, nine to five job. And it was that book that really just kind of changed my mindset to always be thinking of other opportunities. And uh, I know it's not really a personal finance book, but you know, it's something that, you know, I just hired my junior advisor. You know, he's 23, I think, and he's never read it. And wow. I, w- I wanted him to read it, so I bought it for him so he'd read it. Mm-hmm. You know, so he can at least kind of see, you know, what, uh, just to kind of have a different mindset on, you know, how to approach uh, business and, and life and, you know, and other investing opportunities. Okay. Well, man, Jeff, you gave us a lot of good information today. And I, I want to thank you for taking your time out to uh, visit with us. And um, if somebody wants to get in contact with you, um, now, do you, can you only work in the state of Illinois, or how, how does it work? If no, wants- I'm actually, since I'm a registered investment advisor, I can work in any state. Uh, there are some states where it just it's very expensive to get registered, and just for, like, one client. Okay. Uh, like, Texas is one, Louisiana is another, so it's not really worth it to me unless you know now if you got a couple million dollars and live in texas i'll definitely talk to you, you know, if you own, <laughs> own some oil refineries like okay let's chat but yeah. uh no pretty much every other state uh right now we're good to go okay now you but uh, good financial sense i think is is my main hub okay uh c-e-n-t-s good financial sense.com and from there you can kind of reach out to all my other stuff mm-hmm. i mean you'll find my youtube channels facebook twitter LinkedIn, Google Plus, and all the above. Now, I want to say this also. <clears throat> you mentioned a book. Do you, do you have a book out? Is is that what's going on? 
it, the book will be out this year. That is my plan. It's something I've been working on for a couple of years now. And finally, with you know having our third child, transition of new business, kind of had to get some of these other things under wraps. But uh, the the other blog, SoldierFinance.com, that 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 website is actually is is that's the book. I mean, that's the book promotion site. So that's that the name of the book will be Soldier Finance. Okay. And I just want to tell you too, uh, as a last note, you should think about. Um, putting some classes together for how to do a good video. Cause I loved the, your videos is like a professional type thing. I'm like, wow, how does he do this? <laughs> I have, uh, trust me, it's, it, it's like, it's added to the, uh, I have the big idea file. Okay. Which is every time I have what I would consider to be a, a good idea, I'll write it down. I put it in my file now. And, uh, but you know, I can't do everything at one time. So, but yeah, that's something that I definitely have thought about and it has been written down. So we'll okay. see. Well, Jeff, like I said, thanks again. And uh, people can contact you on the uh, Good Financial Sense uh, you got YouTube channel, right? That, that, you can, you, yeah, you can contact me there too. Okay. Well, thanks again, my man. All right. appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, man.